is that bar. Uh, that extra gear, that first three steps. Huge strides in the performance. That I might not be the player I am today. All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear. And uh, this is a bit of a special episode for me. Um, it's close to my heart. But I've got uh, Ron Zabik, who is a, uh, a, a my high school Zed and many other things, but a bit of a mentor for me growing up, uh, obviously in Sudbury, Ontario, going to uh, Ecole, Cat- uh, Ecole Catholique Vitage, right? And uh, I got J- JG with me as well, who's been on the podcast before, who's up in Sudbury, uh, runs the Baseball Academy and is uh, is a teacher up there as well. So how's everyone doing? We'll start with you, Ron. How's everything going up uh, up north? Real good. Real good. Keeping busy on the lake up there? I'm living, I'm living on Joe Lake, jean jules Ben. Yeah. That's yeah, nice and quiet. It's Sudbury's best kept secret. Yeah, there you go. And you found it. Yeah. It's awesome. Water's, water's nice and clear and cool. Yeah. Oh, it's good. And I'm getting some nice weather, which is great too. So mm-hmm. as long as the uh, as long as the bugs don't carry away, you can enjoy some of that weather up there, right? <laughs> yeah, dragonflies are coming. Yeah. They're gonna help me out. <laughs> They'll eat them up. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good northern Ontario thing there. You got the bats at night that eat up the mosquitoes and the and the exactly. And the yep. Day. Yep. That's it. And JG, how you been, buddy? All's good, man. A little uh, deflated after Dougie's announcement yesterday, but we'll uh, we'll overcome it again. Just another setback, and we'll just kind of plug away. Kids are just jumping at the bit to to get outside, be active, compete. Um, but anyways, it is what it is, man. Man, I I was the grumpiest bear yesterday afternoon. I was so rattled. So for those who don't know, in Ontario, we got locked down, basically got extended. So. John Jill runs an indoor facility. We work out of an indoor facility and those are going to potentially be closed to like middle of July now, which is going to be a couple months. And so for guys like JG or myself, we're trying to make a bit of a living doing this. Uh, we're ba- they basically cut the rug out from underneath of us, but they did open up golf and beaches this weekend. So it's going to be just crazy town at all the beaches and all the golf courses. And we can't have a uh, one person in a facility to do a session or do a skate or do a batting. Like it's, it's unbelievable. I was so rattled. Yeah, you got me. Uh, we're we're in the wrong professions, I guess. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, totally. Well, well, for Jean Gilles, I guess he'll be able to do uh, his baseball academy outside, yeah. starting June fourteenth. Yeah, coming up, right, Jay? Yeah, I think there's talking about ten people. We'll be able to get out, so we'll have to probably break up our teams in in sections of two. But the you know we're supposed to start our league like May first. We're supposed to start our league June second. Now, like. We're probably going to be start. Then we're looking at June twelfth. Now we're going to be looking at sometime in July. It's just I feel bad, man. Especially the senior kids uh, in grade twelve, where you know what I mean. You're just pulling it away, and then if they're looking for an opportunity to go post secondary, you kind of pull the rug under them again. It's nobody's fault. It is what it is. But I just feel really bad for those kids. Oh, for sure, man. That's yeah, that's tough. And man, some of these like some of these athletes haven't had a season in an entire year, over a year, right? Like there's some hockey players right now that haven't played a contact game of hockey since last March. And all the way through till now, it's crazy, right? So you're right; it is tough, especially for the ones that are graduating or moving on, and maybe miss out on that last year or that opportunity to get a scholarship or move on or things like that. It's uh, it's tough, man. Really yeah. tough. But um, I got a letter. Yeah. I got a letter typed up. Uh, I'll send it over to you. you. Can sign it. We'll send it over to Big Doug Ford and see what he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've sent a few to MPPs, MPs, and Nothing, you eh? do your thing, man. It is what yeah. it is. Yeah, it's tough for sure. Um, all right, we'll start off with like just a little like just a softball here. But um, so Ron, just you know, in all you've obviously coached and, and taught for years, and a lot of like athletes, and I know you were heavy involved in coaching with high school athletics and stuff like that. But out of your time, probably thousands and thousands of athletes, would I still be ranked like one of the top ten basketball oh players God. that you ever coached at <laughs> in high school at the high school? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> right uh, okay we're done uh, i'm gonna shut this down did, did you owe me off to your, your program yeah. <laughs> don't, worry. don't worry i'm gonna edit that out <laughs> oh my god uh, man no but i mean on, like you you've had but you're a great hockey player though <laughs> thank you, thank you. nice guy yeah nice guy <laughs> great, great personality yeah oh okay. yeah you were on the bench you didn't care <laughs> good. good team guy uh, man. you look good in uniform you look yeah. good in uniform yeah. yeah i wore those short shorts real nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Uh, it was just funny, like going, like when we think back to high school and JG and I've talked about this before, but you know, that was a real big part of high school for me anyways, playing other sports and playing soccer and basketball and all these other things. And I, I just loved it. And you know, Ron, you were a huge part of that, but I guess how did, like when you were growing up and stuff like that, did you know that you always kind of wanted to be a teacher and get into, you know, cause I know when I grew up, I wanted to be a phys ed teacher, like, especially as I got into high school and saw how much of a cake job. No, I'm just kidding. How, how nice the job was you get to do sports all day and work with kids and stuff like that. I'm not saying it's an easy job at all, but yeah. How, how'd you kind of get into it or how? Well, how, it's how, kind of in primary school, it, there was no gym at my school. So yeah. when I went to McDonald Capsi, we had 1600 kids there. It's the year it opened in 1973 wow. or 69, I should say. And in six, I graduated 73. And in 69, when I got there, we didn't have a gym again because the school wasn't ready. So I was going to school in the afternoon at La Salle. So again, in grade nine, I didn't get to play any sports. In grade 10, uh, school was ready, triple gym. I'd never seen anything like it. So grade 10, I started playing from first day of school. I'd be on the football team. And then I'd go from football to hockey to track, a little bit of badminton in there. So uh, in grade 11, my phys ed teacher, uh, chose me to go to an athletic leadership camp at Lake Kuchiching. Yeah. And uh, that that made my decision that I really wanted to get into phys ed. So throughout my high school, I just made sure I knew as many sports as I could. So I was wrestling. I was, you know, playing any sport except for basketball because it was interfering with the hockey. And yeah. so I had cross-country run. I was playing football, hockey, and the whole year so. Oh, that's cool. Got me into it, and I was getting ready to go to the university in phys ed, and yeah, so I did. Uh, oh, that's cool. I wanted to give back what my teachers gave me. Yeah, and I'm re- and I'm really happy to see that Jean Gilles and you are giving back again, and so it multiplies, right? Because there's a lot more, it's like Jamie Lamontagne and all those guys. They're all giving out to the community, coaching, you know, for free all the time, and yeah. they're making a big difference in kids' lives, and that's what I want. Dwayne, can I hijack this for a sec? Oh, anytime. Yeah, yeah give her. So, Ron, what was like the upbringing, though? So you decided to play all those sports in, in grade 10, 11, 12, so on and so forth. Um, what was your upbringing like? Like, is that just something you guys did as a family all the time? Is it just something you might no, no. do? Or how that no. no, my dad never came to saw any games. Really? Or I wasn't really encouraged to do it. It was all from within, right? And all my friends were playing football and hockey. And so it was, it was a group thing that we did all the time. And yeah. I played baseball with these guys. I still curl with the same guys, you know, 50 years later. So that's cool. Yeah. Now growing up, did you play any, like any kind of organized sports growing up? Like did you play? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. My dad uh, was a smelter worker, so he didn't have that many holidays in the summer. So I played little league baseball yeah. as, as a child. And then I played hockey yeah. all the way through playground. And after playground, the city hockey league only had one league like midget hockey. Yeah. Uh, so we played against, uh, Sud- they were Sudbury. I was a Sudbury. And we played against the Zelda and Chemsford and those guys. And Randy Carlisle was playing then for a Zelda. Okay. So, yeah, I, I did one year of that. And then I went straight to high school hockey. Great. Yeah, no, that's cool. It's funny, man. My my first year of hockey, like organized hockey on a team, it was outdoor rink. Like it was on the outdoor rinks. And I tell kids this now and they're like, what? Like you guys played like outside? Yeah, if it snowed with the <laughs> trouble. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. Just in those freezing huts and stuff. But uh yeah, it definitely was uh it, it, I mean that's back in the day, obviously, but it was uh I mean, for me, it was, it was an unreal opportunity and all, and the other thing too, we talk a lot about skill development and JG and I've talked about this a lot about, you know, working on your craft and stuff. And we didn't never thought of it that like that back then, but we spent so much time on the outdoor rinks, you know what I mean? Like just playing with our buddies and really kind of doing skill development, working on your shot or working on moves or whatever. So spent hours and hours and hours doing that, which, you know, obviously translates into what you're doing now. But the, the, the other thing with, uh, with the role kind of as phys ed teacher and anybody who was athletic in high school, I, you know, I, I left, uh, you know, I left heritage at probably grade 12, I think. And I moved down to, to, uh, to Markham to play hockey and got in there and I was more just focused on hockey. Didn't really play any high school sports in Markham, but I got to know the gym teachers well. And it was, it was, it was really cool. Just the kind of the symmetry from school to school and the same type of guys, just like good and girls, like good people, like in it for the right, for the right reasons, want you to be athletic, really promoting that stuff. And and it was a big thing. And I didn't really realize how much of an impact, Ron, that you had on me until later on. You know what I mean? And I start, I kind of thought back and you and I had had a conversation about this. JG and I have talked about this as well. But 
just like how much of a mentor, how much of an impact that that you had on my life, just as far as getting into fitness. Because when I look back, JJ, I don't know what you were like, but when I was in grade nine, like I was a chubby, short, kind of stocky grade nine kid. Like my first couple of years of hockey, I was the tallest kid on my team. And then I never grew again. I was like short and chubby. And uh, I'm wearing, like I, I have sweaters that I could, I wouldn't wear now. They're too big on me that I wore in grade nine. You know what I mean? Like it was just, <laughs> it was kind of hiding. And, you know, and then I got in this, you know, grade nine gym class and, you know, met Masood Zabik. And then all, it just, and, yeah, it was just one thing after another, but it was just that positive reinforcement and that open kind of opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome. So I, I don't know what you were like in grade nine, JG, but yeah, no, it's just, it, my story kind of mirrors yours. I, I, I still remember like it happened yesterday. We we're in a basketball tournament in North Bay and I was in a baseball and stuff like that. And sa- same body type as you, man. So I'm sitting there and um, we're all, the whole team were sitting in a hotel room, wherever the case may be. So I'm talking around about b- baseball and stuff like that. And I'm a bigger kid. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, well, at the time, I'm like, oh, Cecil Fielder, like he's a good player. Like all these players that are like, are I remember dudes, that conversation. Right? I remember and that. Ron's looking at me like, now that I know he's like, you're an idiot. There's like one Cecil Fielder. <laughs> Everybody else in the league's in shape. And you're picking the one guy who's out of shape in this league, right? But that was like my body type. I'm like, well, if he can make it, maybe I got a chance or something like that. But like you said, then it, then it just kind of trickled about like, lifting because we had that little weight room at, at now that i think about it at harrods in the back corner so you know you start getting in the weight room and just the flexibility we were given like you said the role modeling and it was nothing necessarily ron said like hey go do this it was just you see him doing it you're like well dude if he's doing it well, how the hell can i do it right the beep test the, the rugby the all the other stuff basically and, it, and it's like a, a subliminal message it's not like in your face stuff it's more of a subliminal you know, let's do some wrestling. Let's do some gymnastics. Let's do this. Let's do that. So you kind of get out of your, your shell a little bit, but yeah, I still remember that to this day, man, sitting on the bed, like Cecil feel it. Yeah. And just, I, he didn't have to say anything. Just the look was like, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I remember that conversation. <laughs> I also remember Jean Gilles, the time that you, uh, you hurt your knee in, in basketball. Yeah. You sprained your knee there and said, coach, I'll, I'll play, I'll play, I'll play. I said, I'm not playing you. <laughs> baseball is more important than basketball you know you're not going on and he was pissed at me but it doesn't matter yeah yeah exactly not the first guy to get pissed at me so yeah. just wanted to compete man that's all it was yeah, that's right, right. that's right yeah. yeah uh ron who who influenced you on 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 how you approach even teaching and coaching because the one thing with you I, I that i loved and i take a lot of this to me now is you were very you're huge on accountability you know and and the one thing the one rule that we had in gym class is basically don't do what I didn't ask you to do. So if I didn't ask you to touch the balls, don't touch the balls. If I say, go touch the balls, you can grab the balls, shoot baskets. That's good, but don't do. And if you do something that I didn't ask you to do, it's 50 push ups. There was no like, and like by, you know, by about day two, it was like all, all you'd hear is 50 or sank out in French 50. And then guys would be on the ground doing 50. <laughs> you know, like <it> just, <laughs> well, I think the guys were going on the ground and starting to do 50 till yeah. I turned around. Right. That's true. So the good. idea was, yeah, I'll give you 50 and good guys like you probably did them, but, most well, you never got any, but uh, the <laughs> guys know, got the the guys who were getting a lot of fifties learned the trick pretty fast. They, they just knew that I was not happy with them. Yeah, do your fifties, but they didn't do their fifties, and I didn't care. They got the message that I wasn't pleased with it, you know. Okay. But you're right about accountability, you know. And when it came to teams and stuff, um, there was three rules. Rule number one is family first. Jean Jade probably remembers that too. Eh? Yeah. Family is first, and then school is second, and then basketball is third. Yeah, boyfriends, girlfriends, everything else has to, or jobs, or or hockey. So, so I, I'd ask a kid. He's a good hockey player. He comes in. He says, "Well, I want to play basketball." I said, "Okay, you've got a hockey game and a basketball game the same day. Where are you going?" Well, mom and dad are paying for the ice time. Right? It's expensive yeah. to play hockey. So the kid would say, "Well, I'm going to play hockey," and and I said, "Hey, that's fine." Play hockey, you know, you that basketball, hockey, school, you got too much on your plate. So yeah. basically, and and coaches ask, well, how do you get the kids to go to practice? You know, they're, they've got teams where half the people show up to practice. Well, it didn't happen with me because if you missed a practice, you missed a game. So people yeah. show up, accountability. I have to be there. You have to be there. So yeah. to, to me, it's kind of simple, but. Oh, I, yeah, I think it's huge, it's man. It's not simple. <laughs> it would still work today, I'm sure. Yeah. 
No, it, I, I think in GG, you can comment on this too, man. I think it, it does work. And, and when, when, when kids get to know you, you know what I mean? And they know what you're like and, and your philosophy and how you, you know, just like that, you miss practice, you miss a game. It's clear as day. You know, the problem I think more so now is you get the parents that come in and, you know, they're like, well, I, yeah, I was laid from work and that, which is totally fine. I understand there's a lot of outside things, but you know, this is the rule and this is what, this is what it's going to be. And then I think once kids get it, they, they do fall in line, but I don't know what your experience has been JG overall with that kind of stuff, as far as, you know, players buying into that. I mean, you're, you're a lot like that as well, where, you know, you're big on accountability and stuff. Yeah. And well, I just kind of mimic a little bit, we we're talking about the push-ups, and I, I remember in class, like you, Ron's talking about the team setting, but I found his classes were even a team setting, right. Where, um, I don't know the classes were like a team for some reason. I don't know. Now that I think about it, it was never like, Oh, it's just a Zed class. Cause I still remember those classes, you know, guys having to do 50 and they'd start running their mouths a little bit. And the class would like police itself. If that made any sense, like yeah. dude, shut up, get your 50 in so we can move on with our day and do whatever we got to do. Right. So it was, it was, it was getting policed in the house, basically not like the hazing or any of that stuff. Just like, shut up, do what you got to do. And then it's like, Ron didn't even have to say anything. He just did his thing 50 then he'd go do whatever he had to do. And the rest of us kind of it policed itself, um, which I wanted to jump on that one. And the other one too is like stairs, man, running those stairs at heritage. Holy smokes. I don't know people do that stuff anymore. And I just think about what great exercise it was at the time. Um, and how well, much of a game changer it was. Well, <laughs> I don't think it was for exercise. It was to <laughs> weed out the guys, right? I mean, if you're going to run all this, like I would run the hell out of you guys for a good two weeks. And then those who stuck around really wanted to play. So you weren't necessarily the best athlete that I was keeping. I was really keeping the guys who really want to play. And then you can be competitive. You know, you don't need, I never ran after the superstar in the hallways to say, if he wants to play basketball, I would never ask anybody to play basketball. You know, you want to play, show up. If you don't want to play, don't show up. I think that's, I, I like that a lot. And just even getting like, one thing I find now with, with, uh, with our newer generation is, you know, young kids don't know how to work hard. Like they think they're working hard, but they don't know how to push to that next kind of level. And Jill, you and I've talked about like Goggins and these guys that just like mentally are tough and they're, they're doing insane things and they just push their mind, you know, over because your body's capable of a lot, but a lot of times your mind shuts you down. Right. So I think that is, you know, things like that, you do see guys, you know, kind of fall apart and, and, you know, too much hard work, they're going to quit. And I think it's a great way for coaches out there to even, you know, find a way to weed out some of the, some of the ones that maybe aren't bought in. And to your point, JG, about that culture and stuff, I think you're right. I remember doing, uh, there, there was one phys ed class. It was a lot of running. We would run the hills in the back, like in the woods and stuff like that. And um, those like, that was, they were baggers. I remember I had to do a couple of loops on the one track up this hill and back down. And, but man, I loved it. Like, and we had guys like GG and grandma zone. These other guys were athletes and you'd push each other and try to beat each other. And it was just a fun, like I'd look forward to it. And the other thing too, is we didn't waste a lot of time. You know, if we had a bunch of bad apples that were, that were, that were getting pushups, we knew that that's taken away from our 90 minutes gym class. Like, let's go, man, we're going to go play rugby. We're going to go do this. Let's, you know, let's not mess around. So to your point, GG, I think, yeah, a lot of us did kind of self-police, you know, like, let's go, man, just get them done. So we can get out here, you know? And I think that's huge too, because there's a lot of wasted time right now with practices and gym class and all this stuff where I think it could be maximized a lot more for sure. Yeah. But my question, kind of like Ron or both of you, basically like where, and I remember I was, I was in university, I called Ron. I was like, Hey man, like I'm doing this project. I'm in education. I'm doing this project. I'm like, how the kid, you know, why are the kids so different now? You know, I was asking this, like, I don't know how many years ago anymore when I was in university and he's like, kids haven't changed. He goes, what they're dealing with right. now is maybe different, right? The kids haven't changed. They're always the same. Just they're dealing with more stuff. And then maybe now they're dealing with more stuff because of social media now. And it just keeps trickling wherever the case may be, but the kids have not changed. But like what's changed because like, I would love to do some of the things then, but then I'm considered it, not, I don't care what I'm considered, but it's just considered old school. But like, that's the stuff that gets it done, man. I just, I don't know. Like, I just love the fact Ron's like, I was just, whoever's left is what I'm going to deal with. I'm not going to go kiss anybody's ass to be able to be on the team. You want to be on the team. This is what you got to do. You're in, you're in, you're out, you're out. And I don't know, man, Dwayne, I don't know if there's somebody else wants to jump on that. Like where, where's the limit now? Is there even a line somewhere or how does that play out? Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Cause I, I think that's wicked advice that he gave you. Cause I never thought about it that way, but Ron, you're right. Like the kids haven't changed. It's the environment. Yeah, Human nature hasn't changed. The way we treat kids has changed. 
Yeah. So if you look at even on the educational system, uh, kids don't fail high school anymore, but you get to college and university, you will fail. Yeah. You know, if you don't have good work habits and stuff. So you can't pussyfoot around them all the time and give them exactly what they want because they might not be being pushed at home, but they, you know, like if, if you want them to, to learn discipline and stuff, I think you don't have to discipline them, just teach them hard work, you know, in practice or, or whatever sport you're doing. You, you, they won't, they won't die from it and they're going to, they're going to appreciate you after, you know, maybe not at the moment, but after, they, oh, that was a good time, you know, like, totally no, that's, I, how I, that's how I take it. I, it was never about winning. It was about forming people who are good team, team people, right? Because the job is you're working with a team, whether you're secretary or principal or whatever you are, you're on a team. Yeah. You got to be a good team person. No, I think that's huge. I think the other thing too with it is you know, going back to I parenting, right? Like if you have a if you have a kid that comes in who's maybe a bit of a bad apple or got a bit of an attitude, a lot of times you meet the parents who are like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, it's the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree sometimes. But I think as parents, we want what's best for our kids. And I I'm I'm guilty of it. I think sometimes I pave a bit too nice of a road for my kids. You know, I try to be a little bit hard, a little bit old school, but I want my kids to have a better life than I had, right? But you talk about, you know, the way my family I was raised and Ron, the way you were raised, like your dad worked a lot. You know, your dad didn't have holidays, didn't go to your games. Now we feel guilty if we can't make a game or if we can't pay for that player to go to this extra skill session or whatever. We're like, no, don't feel guilty. You're, you know, you're working, you're a father, mother, like you're doing the best that you can and your kid doesn't need to have everything. And I think, you know, teaching hard work is, is something that I think we don't do enough of at home. I think like starting it's, out. With it's, not, it's not just the hard work, Dwayne. It's, it's also, um, you've got to raise your kids to be independent. Like you, you won't be around forever. So they've got to be independent, you know, and learn how to take care of themselves. And being part of a team is, is a big factor of that. Totally. No, you not everybody's going to be the star. You know, somebody's got to sit on the corner of the bench and, and you take it. You know, Dwayne, what's, what's funny is I, yesterday I watched my class of this week when we had Blake Sloan on. And that's the question you had talked to Blaine about. Or Blake, sorry, you're just like, the rest of us are like the third, fourth liners, man. He was the, you know, I remember you saying like the one liners example for hockey, they're like the 1% or the 1% of the 1%, but like the world consists of second, third and fourth liners. That's basically what the world consists of basically. And I, I don't know, it's just kind of mirroring a little bit with, with uh, what Ron's talking about right there. Basically, I think anyway. Yeah, totally. And when we talk about like, talk like somebody, I, I get this question all the time. Like what, like what's, what, separates guys that make it or girls that make it to college or on team Canada or the NHL. And one of the, they're all skilled. They can all do the stuff for me. The biggest separating factor for these elite players and elite athletes and human beings in general is just good people. Like the, 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 those real elite players that are playing in the NHL that have had that opportunity. Most of them are good people. Like they're good. They're, they, yeah, they're a bit, you know, they got confidence and they're, they, they work hard and things, but they're good people. Like, you know what I mean? And I think that's a big thing that you know, as parents, and I preach this all the time, like, don't worry about going to hockey. Don't worry about doing skill sessions. Worry about your kid being a good kid. Like a Sunday dinner to me is way more important than going to that extra skate or that extra baseball practice. Like, I think, you know what I mean? Having some time with your kids and like valuable time, going for a bike ride or whatever it is, go for a walk. But that is to me so huge. And I think we miss it a lot. Like the pandemic's kind of reeled everything back because now we probably have overkill of time together. But, uh, but you know, <laughs> you know, on a regular week, right. You got basketball practice, you got piano, you got extra tutoring, you got all this stuff. And we don't take time to like, just get to know our kids, get to know our family. And, and, you know, even within our family, we're a team, like, you know, we're, we're my kids and I, and my wife, we're a team, you know, I don't like my team all the time, but it's my team, right. It's my team. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I was, it's like, you're opening up a wound. You're like, maybe we'll get there too much right now. Yeah. <laughs> <Your face. laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, well, if I go back to what you just asked, who gets to be the elite? I, I, I always saw this three things. First of all, you need the body, you know, to be the elite. You need the brains, the IQ, like the sports IQ. And then the biggest one is the drive. Yeah. You know, if you have those three things, you're, you're in pretty good shape. No, oh, for sure, man. And that drive, like GG, I don't I don't know about what you were like as a youngster, but I remember like throughout my whole life and I still have it. I have this voice in my head that like is that pushes me, you know what I mean? And I don't know what other people's voices are because I don't know what's in their head. Right. But I, you know, I don't want to go for a run when I get home, but I'm like, I got it. I didn't do anything today. So like 
I don't, I'd rather just sit out and have a beer, but I'm like, no, I'm, I got to do this, you know? And I don't know about you, JG, but did, like, did you have that voice kind of growing up that kind of pushed you to do that extra session or that extra run or that extra hitting or anything like that? I had it this morning, man, when I woke up, like I still have it every single day, that voice. And it's like, for me, cause I'm still training, I'm still running, I'm still lifting, doing stuff. I'm like, is today the day that's what keeps me going every day is because there's a day that's what I talk to athletes. Let's there's just going to be a day where it, it clicks. Right. But you'll never, ever know when that day is. If you give up, you will never know when that day is. So for me, that's what kind of gets me going. It's like, is today the day that I get a PB in this is today the day where I'm going to run this far and I'm not going to be as tired. Is this the day that I'm going to break the, you know, whatever eight minute mile for me or whatever the case may be. Right. Is today the day. So for me, that's what kind of wakes me up in the morning, basically. It's like, right. Cause you put your time in. So you're like, when's this going to pay off? Well, if you give up, you'll never know when that time's going to pay off. So that's what kind of keeps me literally still to this day. Yeah. And Ron, what about you? Do you have that voice growing up in your head? I did, but it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it retired. <laughs> oh yeah. I used to run from telephone pole to telephone pole to train on, you know, on yeah. Cause we didn't have all that equipment there, but yeah, I, I, I would train for my sports. So yeah. when I was young, I was, you can call yourself an athlete if you train for whatever sport you're in. hundred percent. Right. Yeah. If you just, if you're just good at your sport, you're a player. You're yeah. not an athlete. No, You've no, got to no. train. Yeah. I can't remember what it was when I was, I don't know if it was a book I read or a plot anyways. And to go back to that, it was a guy who had like kind of a dream as a golfer. And he said he had a dream and he was talking to God and God said, you're going to be, you know, don't worry about winning championships. You're going to win the PGA. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Just keep, you know, just keep playing, keep practicing hard, stuff like that. And then before you could ask him like, well, which one am I going to win? Like, which year am I going to win? And boom, the dream kind of disappears. So the guy's like, every day I would just keep going and going because I never knew, you know, if this is going to happen, when the hell is it going to happen? Is it 10 years from now? Is it next year? Is it now? So he's like, I just kept grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding. I was like, it's a, it's, I, I, I like that perspective. You just don't know what day it's going to happen. Yeah. And Ron, I don't think it ever. And again, I don't think your voice ever left you because, well, maybe it left you, but like, I'm, I'm thinking back, like you raised like, three amazing kids, obviously, right. They're great people, your grandchildren. Now you still, there's still something that's going through there, the way you're talking to them, the way you're doing things. So I think you got to give yourself a little bit more credit. There's something going on upstairs. If not, no, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the one, the little voice that said, run between the telephone poles. <laughs> the little yeah. voice says, start why, training. why do you still curl? Why do you still curl? Oh, because I enjoy it. I'm past the trying to go to the provincials and stuff like that, but I, I, I still, oh, I'm still very competitive. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Oh yeah. yeah. There it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> still throwing brooms around the around the corner. <laughs> you your shot. Oh, I never did that one. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's the other one on that one. I want to jump on that. You for me, anyways, unless it was something somewhere else, you're always able to keep your composure. I've seen some coaches, and we don't have to mention names, but just lose their marble, wherever the case may be. You are always pretty good at keeping your composure, your calm. And, you know, players play off that or athletes play off their coaches in regards to that. Instead of an emotional roller coaster, basically things kind of stay consistent. Um, How'd you do that? Or what did you do? Well, the, the rule for me was very simple. The refs, ref, players play, coaches, coach. I don't try to play. And I didn't want a ref trying to coach my kids. You know, keep your role, and th- there's no reason to get embarrassed uh, or or embarrassing yourself by getting what you want. So if I want to, if I needed to protect my team because I thought the ref was unfair, I could go get a technical in a very nice way. You know, excuse me, sir, can you give me a technical because I think 16 fouls to one doesn't make sense. You know, yeah. so or I'd say something like, "Hmm, your house must be close to the school." technical right because i'm insulting him saying he's a homie so you do, you do things that way and you don't lose respect from your kids from your, your team and and the official gets the message right yeah oh, i've done some weird things too while i'm coaching i'll tell you like i remember one coach like you said they lose it right i had one coach uh, i had a great i had grade sixes i was coaching grade sixes and the other coach was basically grade eights and Score was like 49 to nothing in the first half. 
and he's still pressing, you know. So I call a timeout and I tell him, I didn't tell the coach anything, but in a nice way, I told my daughter, Nicole, who was playing for me, I says, take the ball out and give it to the girl who's pressing. Let her score. So she gives them the ball, they score. Do it again, Nicole. Gets the ball, gives it to the other team, they score again. So the coach called the timeout. He says, what are you doing? I says, well, you want to score 100 points? I'll let you score 100 points. You know, everybody goes home happy. And uh, you got the message, right? So he pulled his team back a little bit. Let me cross half. You know, you, you've got to do things like that, but you don't have to lose your mind, you know? Don't have to get yeah, mad at him. Right, not down. That's a good one. It's funny he says that story. I was literally going to tell the same story because I was playing for him. We were tournament in Tim and same thing, man. The team was just pressing us. He's like, just leave the ball there and let them do their thing. And it took the other team like two possessions to figure it out. Like you're up by like 30. What, what, what's the point here, right? Yeah. So then that's the same thing, man. They took the press off and let us play a little bit. But yeah, uh, yeah, you're sending your message without sending your message. So you just didn't do it then. It seems like you've been doing it throughout your whole career, which is good. Yeah, I probably did it a couple of times. Well, you know, my team was never allowed to score 100 points. I would never let my team. Well, it's time to let your bench play more and don't need to embarrass anybody, you know. So just play the game. Be good sport about it. And Mitch Lalonde, you would know him from LaSalle secondary. He never scored 100 points against us, you know. He could have. He could have easily, but he never did because it's not a sportsman thing to do. Yeah. Especially, I think that's one of the big things with coaching though in minor in minor sports or high school, elementary school. Oh, like, why are you coaching? Are you coaching to score 100 points and show how good yeah. of a coach you are? Are you, are you? are you coaching to develop the kids? Like you said, like play your bench or, hey, you can't score until you make three passes or let's work on our defense a little bit more. And let the, you know, let right. the, at the end of the day, what are the kids getting out of just pressing a team? You know what I mean? Like I, I don't get it. And hockey, the same thing happens. I get so frustrated with it because – you know, a team's way better than another team and they're spanking them. Well, why is your first unit power play? Why do you even have a power play? These kids are eight, nine, 10 years old. Like yeah. it's, it's crazy. And I, I just, yeah, I don't have any time for it at all. It's brutal. It's a lose, lose situation, right? Yeah, totally. Cause your kids get cocky and the other kids get down and don't like the game. So. Yeah. Oh, for sure. If you want to get me fired up, we'll keep on this subject. If well, I We've guess. all lived it, John. Yeah. I, but, I know, but it just blows me away. People like, I think, and, and this is me making an assumption, people that are in that role that'll keep their foot on the gas because they've never had any success in their lives. I just personally think. <laughs> and the only way they're going to get success is by flooring you. And for some reason, they'll go to work on Monday, go around the work cooler and tell them, hey, I throttled Dwayne and he played pro hockey or blah, blah, blah. And you know what? I'm a better coach because my team beat his. There's way too many people like that. And they drive me nuts. Because they do not see further than this. Mm-hmm. It drives me nuts. Yeah. But to your point, a lot of them, I don't think a lot of them have played like high level anything. Like, I don't think, right. you know, and a lot, and we see it here all the time. Minor hockey is terrible for it, and a lot of sports are, but, you know, the coach is, you know, trying to win a championship. Like, we're going to win a championship. We got to win. We got to win. The kids are 10 years old. Well, is that the goal of the season? Like, I think the goal of the season is to make your kids better, get them to understand the game, be good teammates. Like, and they're going to get better by doing that. But, you know, playing your top five players as much as you can so you can win makes no sense to me. Like, it's just, it's so backwards on the thought process. The way I've started measuring it <clears throat> is if I started coaching a group of kids, uh, let's pick an age group, like six, seven, eight years old. If they're still playing when they're 15, 16, you've done your job. You've That's literally awesome. done your job. If not, chances are this is what happened. Rewind. You wanted to win so bad, so you played the same kids at the same positions the entire time. Kids who sat the bench said, I'm done. I'm going to go play another sport. I'm over it. Then your team got less kids, less kids. Kids are over it. Boom, done. I guarantee that's what it looked like. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point for sure. You want, you want lifelong learners, man. You know, back to Ron, you want to develop human beings. If you want to develop human beings, let them play. Let them do things. Let them fail. Let them succeed. But like playing the same kids over and over just so you can go put a you know, I remember Ron talking about this when he was retired. He's like, hey, you want some trophies, some medals? Come over. I'm just getting rid of them. I'm getting like, who cares? Yeah. Right. Who cares about the trophies and medals at the end yeah. of the day, man? It's probably, you're probably wrong. I'm just making an assumption. Like I know for Dwayne and I, this is we're in heaven right now, but I'm sure for you that the mentorship you've given, this means more than if we gave you a trophy or a medal. Oh, talking to my ex-students who've done well in, in their sports is the, my biggest gift, right, yeah. as, as a coach, seeing a kid succeed. 
Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it's, you know, it's always, it's, yeah, it's always nice to get feedback from somebody as you're getting older, whether they're going to university or beyond. And and a lot of times when you're going through it, and this is for me personally, but when I'm going through high school and I get to know Ron and I'm loving gym class and I'm loving what you're bringing to my life, I don't realize until probably it was, I, I think it was a great, you know, out of university. I was like, oh man, like that was, and you know, you're thinking about different things, but I'm like, that was a really, you know, impactful. And I, I, I just, so everyone kind of knows where this whole call came about, but I, uh, JG and I talk all the time and I was like, Hey, you got to send me Ron's number. I got to give him a call. And JG and I had talked about this before, but I was like, I want to tell Ron how much he meant to me. Cause I hadn't talked to Ron in years. And I, was, I still think about you often because there's things that happen in my life where I'm like, Oh yeah, you know, totally. I remember this, remember that. And, and I called you and just told you like, you know, it, it was something I wanted to do for years. And I probably was just too, whatever it was nervous or whatever to do it. But I want, I think it's important for people to tell people what they mean to them early in life rather than, you know, when they're in the hospital or on their deathbed or you know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, man, let them know what they mean to you. And I think it was, you know, it was, uh, I'm glad I did it. Not, not even selfishly for me. Um, cause I got, I, I wanted to get that out to, to you, Ron, but I just, I wanted you to know. And I know, and I said this to you when I talked to him, like, I'm sure you've had these conversations with many of your students, which is awesome. You know, like many of your, many of your, uh, you know, students that have moved on and stuff like that, which is great. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. I, it was a good process for me to go through number one and something that I want to do more of, you know, and, and let people know what they, you know, what kind of impact they had on my life, you know? Yeah. It, se- it seemed to be a tough call for you that day. You seemed shy about it and, you know, yeah, uh, for sure. but, it, but it's not, you know, it's greatly appreciated by anybody who, who feels what they did was appreciated by somebody else. So, no, no. It was just a bit awkward when it was just a bit awkward when I said, "Yeah, it's Dwayne." Dwayne, who? Dwayne Black? Who's that? I was like, "Oh no, <laughs> no, no, no." <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on though is some of these like talk to Faye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> my sister. <laughs> um, but one thing too, like when I when I was just saying, like you know, you remember these moments, and and then I'm experiencing them in my life. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that happening, but. You had a lot of like teaching points or teaching moments that you, that I remember for me personally. And JJ, I'd love you to share some years too. Like the, like even the one that you did about, uh, about Cecil Fielder and stuff. But I remember being running, we were on a run on the road and, uh, it was me and I can't remember who I was with one or two guys. We were, we had a good clip going and we were, you know, kind of leading the pack or whatever. And then we're going and all of a sudden like Ron's bit blows by us. Like, and I'm, we're, we're not gasped, but like, I, I'm not, I can't push much harder than this. And he gets about. I don't know, probably 50, hundred meters in front of us and then kind of paces with us. But it's far enough that we can't really push it. Like it's hard <coughs> to catch that. Right. So we finished the run. Ron beats us. We got, we have a little push at the end and he, and he, he ends up pushing too and beats us. So after I'm talking to him, like, uh, you know, and then he, so I was like, how, like, how, like, you know, how'd you do that? And so I remember he used to tell me, he's like, you're like, it's all mental. It's like, I came by you guys fast. And then I just kept pace with you guys. And I remember you saying like, it was hard for me, like to, like, to, like to kind of put that little push on. And, but he's like, it's all mental. When I went by you guys, basically I broke you guys down a little bit. Like, how does he have this much juice left? And then I just paced myself with you guys a little bit ahead. And then I could kind of keep track. And I was like, so I've done it. I've done it to kids that, that I've been running with. <laughs> and one thing that you did, and you always played every sport with us, man, whether it was rugby, wrestling, like everything. And that I think is really important for coaches. You know, people ask me like, oh, you know, you stay in shape and stuff. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, if I'm working with an NHL guy and I show up on the ice and I'm 30 pounds overweight and I can't really touch my feet anymore. It's hard. You know, that's a different conversation than if I can still move and I can still, you know, right. compete a little bit and stuff, you know? So um, there was a lot of little like tidbits like that, that I took from you. That was like, yeah, like, oh yeah, that was, that was really good. Just broke like a couple of high school students just broke us in half on this <laughs> run. Really cool, man. I was never in front of those packs. So I never had those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were there, Josh. Oh man. And then, yeah, go, you got some G? No, but I did. I was like two years ago. I told Dwayne that too. I ran a marathon two years. It took me six hours and like 15 minutes, but I finished it. They didn't take me off the track because there was actually a pacer car. So I finished it. But I think like forever, that was more of like, I wanted to do it mentally to make sure I can get through stuff like that. But again, if it wouldn't have been, I guarantee you, I can, I can hundred percent guarantee if it wasn't for those classes. Cause I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that like a 10 K we used to do like in front of Cambrian Ford, rip back around. And come back to school. Was it a ten k? Uh, off Lavike, off yeah. Lavike, and we go down Fourth Avenue. That was one of the ten k, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So I remember I did the I did the ten k. I actually finished it and did it like legit. Didn't take shortcuts, any of that shit. It was like the it was like probably the best day of my life. Like think about it, you're like whatever you're 16, 17, 
and running 10 K you felt like you just, you could take on the world basically after that's weird, right? Like you'd think it's, I have to win money or I have to have got drafted or whatever the case may be. It was just those small victories. Cause when we start in grade nine, like Dwayne and I are our body types, let's say at the time. And then next thing you know, you're running 10 K within like two, three years, or wherever the case may be. It's just, it just, it, well, it just opens more doors, I guess. You were running half marathons at the end of the year, right? We, yeah, but we, we, I, I never looked at it that way. I'll yeah, tell you that. But you did I run like, half. Oh, shit, I got to get this done if I want a good grade. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, and the yeah, the running piece was huge to me. I remember my first couple runs ever. I started doing them at home because I was getting into this grade nine stuff. And I remember I couldn't run. I had to walk, I had to run like a minute, I think it was. And I literally would stop, walk for a minute, run a minute, walk a minute, run, you know what I mean? And then got better and better and better. And then, like you said, Jay, after like a year, two years of training and working and running and stuff like then I I was became a pretty good runner, like for my body type and you know, whatever. But and I still run to this day because of that. It was a big, big impact, obviously on, on, on who I am now. Right. And just those, like you said, Jay, those, just those little, those, those, those years of classes, those years of lessons, you know what I mean? Hey, I want to ask you something though, JG, when you were going through that marathon, which congratulations, that's like mm-hmm. never done that. That's unbelievable. What kind of mental places did you go while you were running? Oh and boy. I can see like the first couple kilometers, you're kind of getting into it and then you kind of settle, but man, like at, at mile, like 10, 15, like, yeah. yeah what kind of mental places were you going? So that's, that's a great question because the night before <clears throat> it's, um, the runs in Arizona. So they have on YouTube, the whole run through, well, like not the whole run, but like good sections of the trail. So I literally sat in front of the laptop the night before. And the first, first section was all dirt. So I'm like, okay, hey, on the dirt track, I'm going to talk to my dad. Right. It reminds me of camping, shit like that. This piece here, I'm going to talk to so-and-so. Like, in my mind, I'm like, I'll deal with this issue in my life. I'll deal with that issue in my life. Da, da, da. I did the first, like, mile, and everything went to shit. I just <laughs> forgot about everything. I just wanted to survive after the first mile. Like, you're like, I want to beat this person. This person can't beat me. Like, look at their shoes. Like, yeah. everything just turned to compete and then finding angles. Like, you'd have ramps in the bush a little bit. I'm like, no, if I stay low, my left knee will get more transition. The next one, I got to go to the right. So then I'm balancing off my legs. Like that's the, sh- I started playing all these mind games with me. Distances get to this point. Uh, yeah. So I went in with a game plan and it just went uh, to shit. Basically the game plan went there and your mind just, it literally takes you in so many different places. I was at, I think Costco, cause that's the only thing that's open now. Anyways, about a month ago with my wife and I was telling her at one point, I was probably at like mile 15 or so. And like, my knees are bad, man. I, I couldn't feel my legs where the case may be. And there's traffic coming this way and I'm running this way. I was literally in my head thinking if the car swerves, I'm dead. I can't even jump out of the way. Like I'm literally dead. Like I'm preparing myself mentally for someone to text and hit me. And I'm like, I'm going to jump on the windshield. And I'm I literally, that's the stuff I'm thinking about. <laughs> so I'm like, I literally can't push myself off if I see the car coming. Um, but then the guy I was with, like I was with a group of guys. He would come in kind of like Ron did, right? Like he'd, he'd blow, he's way past. He'd come back, you know, talk to me and just like, hey man, about life and your wife and your kids and where the case may be. So it kind of gives you that cool. that new energy. So that pushes you for a couple of miles. And then guys who had finished the race had come back for me basically um, and just kind of helped me push through the end basically. But it was literally at the point in my head saying like, right, right foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, like keep it as simple, literally as possible, basically. And just keep driving through, keep driving through Uh and picking people off, man, literally seeing people fail or give up gives me more juice, gives me more energy. Like I was there with like a a pro base MLB, MLB player. He had to bail out his hamstring where the case may be. And I was like, yeah, one soul taken, right? David Goggins, man, took his soul, right? I'm like, he didn't make it. He didn't make it. He didn't make it. So I just, I felt I was getting more energy off of non-successful people and people quitting. That's kind of gave me a little more energy at the end too. I love it, man. I've always been like that though. Even I've done 10 key races and stuff. And that's like, I just want to peg people off. Like I see somebody ahead of me. I want to take them down. Next person, guy, girl, grandma, stroller. I don't care. I'm getting them. I'm getting them. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny you say that. I can't barely skate. We're on, um, What's the skating over here in Sudbury? The uh, athletic. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I'm I'm struggling at the skate. I'm getting better. And it's funny you say that because I was skating and my wife and kids are like way ahead of me. I finally catch up. I'm like, do you guys see that? Like, what? I, I just passed a four year old and she was like <laughs> on a chair. So I'm like, I blew her away. Blew her away because <laughs> I just 
little moments in my life, man. <laughs> little, oh, totally. little wins, man. Little wins. <laughs> <laughs> Time my own skates now. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, have you ever done a, have you ever done a marathon? Because I know you ran a ton like back in the day, but have you ever done any races or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I did a few times, yeah. but not too often. I, I didn't like um, the competitive racing part because I pushed myself too hard. Yeah. So then you start too hard and you have a hard time. You're struggling the whole way, right? Like I used to tell you guys, don't go anaerobic. Make sure you're, yeah. you can talk to somebody. Or, or So I pushed myself in class where I, I ran the 17 half marathons. Yeah. But uh, it's crazy. that was just for fun, right? <laughs> no, it's still, it's never for fun with me. I've always got the stopwatch there and how yeah. much time I'm like, you know, like work the clock all the time. And totally. it's like the prep too, right, Ron? Like your nutrition, your shoes, your clothing, like it's a whole, like it's, you're going into a fight basically, or you're yeah. going into a game, right? Yeah. Yeah. I never even looked at it that way. Like, Hey, man, you need these shoes, you need these gel packs. And you know, I was like, what are you talking about, man? I just want to tie some shoes and run. And like, that's not how it works. Yeah. You can do it, I guess, but it's not how it works. Yeah. Oh yeah. I totally got to be prepared, man. Especially for something like that. Like that is, that is massive. Like, you know, yeah. A marathon is, is you're hundred percent right. That's a competition. Um, well, that, that, that's hard on the body. That's yeah. really hard on the body. Well, I've got pictures of afterwards. I can't walk. I couldn't even yeah. walk. And my knees must've been this big. Yeah. But I cried, man, like a baby. When I finished, I cried like a baby. I don't know what it is, man. It's just like your body just kind of lets go of everything everything yeah it's unbelievable but even like when, when you finished it though and you said this earlier but like how proud like when you sat back i know you're in pain that like that night and stuff but when you sit back even now and think about it like not a lot of people ran marathons i know there's marathons every year and every every week and you know pre-pandemic there's but there's not a lot of people that, that can say that they ran a marathon you know and i i don't know like to me that's a proud like i'd be super proud of that like that's a that's a cool accomplishment right there that, that, and you're not a marathon runner. You're not, you're not a guy. <laughs> I'm not you know built I mean? for marathons. Right. So like, that's, that, that's, that's an amazing accomplishment, man. And even just to mentally pop, you know, kind of plow through it. That's, it's awesome. But like, it's like that metal and that penny and stuff like as in a box in the bottom of my, of my uh, closet, but it, cause it's just like, what's next? Literally like, it's not something I need to put up somewhere and everybody needs to see. Cause I'm just like, Hey, what's next? What, what's the next challenge? What's the next thing? Um, but yeah, it, it was tough, but it was tough. Two things, man, that I had no family around. And then when uh, we won our conference in West Virginia, we won conference, um, same thing, won that. It's like, I think I'm at the epitome of my life, at the, the pinnacle for baseball. I'm like, and nobody's around that I know, like my teammates, but no family, no friends. And same thing with that. I'm like in Arizona, my wife's here. I, I, I was had her on the phone and stuff, thank God. But it's just not to say, like, to re-look at everything, none of that means anything without your family. Zero. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's banging on for sure. I remember, uh, to your point, uh, Ron, when I, my, one of my first 10 Ks I ran and I went out of the blocks, just like you're talking about, like heavy, like a real fast pace, trying to pass everybody, trying to get up at like, you know, up whatever. And by like kilometer three, I'm like, I don't know if I could do this, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I looked at my splits afterwards and they were like crazy quick at the beginning. And then they kind of obviously leveled off. I ended up getting through it, but yeah, it's, it's you know, around people, I mean, I'm, I'm getting through these people. I want to get ahead. I want to get ahead. I want to get ahead. And then, yeah, you kind of end up kind of blowing it a little bit in the first two, three kilometers. And then it's, that's, that makes for a tough little run for sure. But I'm still understanding that stuff to like, to this day, literally taking that as a life metaphor of like pace yourself. But it's so crazy, man. You just feel like you have all the energy. You think you know everything. Like, Ron, I'm sure this is your laughing at both of us now. But, like, like no, I'm not. I, I, I'm just thinking of all the track experiences I've lived. And I was a, I was a finish line judge in Sudbury here. And uh, everybody, the good, good runners, they're going to take off like crazy, right? But they can maintain their pace. Yeah. While the, the people who aren't as fit want to keep up with them. Well, you see them dying after the second lap there. And, you know, they didn't run. You've got to run your race. Yeah, you're going to come in 15th place, but that's as good as you can do. And that's fine. You know? Yeah. He worked harder or whatever, but, or he's more athletic, whatever, but let him win and you come in 15th. It's okay. You know? Yeah, totally. I remember in, in elementary school doing a, doing a track meet at Heritage. And uh, so we were up there and I, I was in the 400. I was in a couple of different ones, but I remember this 400 race. And so 400 meters, one lap around the track, no problem. My my normal race would have been run a good pace at the start and then kick it at the end, right? And whatever. 
Well, I was watching a couple of races before us in the couple of heats and this one guy kind of took off fine. And then on the straightaway, he took off, like got like, and then kind of had a nice lead and then just made it in. So it was like right before the race, I'm like, I'm doing that. <laughs> so I totally changed my race. Like it was just not a long race talking a minute and whatever. Right. But yeah, so I did that and I ended up pulling away and I think I was doing, I actually was, was doing good, but man, I'm like, I almost didn't make the 400. Like, I almost didn't even finish the crock. <laughs> it's like, what am I doing? But you talk about like having a game plan and sticking to it. Like totally didn't do that. Um, but yeah, it's funny. And to your point, Jay, like I think in life, man, just having a bit of a plan and trying to stick to it as much as you can, you might deviate here and there, or Bob and weave, but uh, I think that's huge, man, whether it's skill development or financials or whatever, but having a plan is massive. Like what you talk when Ron's talking about, like, it's okay to be in 15th and everyone tries to like take off and try to be the person when they know they're not the person. And I think back at the business perspectives, you and I have talked about how many pop-up people are going to try starting businesses like yours in your area and they're be- they think they're better than you and blah, blah, blah. But like you're in it for the right reasons. You're doing it for the right reasons. So you're at your own pace and people are trying to sprint to get there. And then they just flame out, man. They literally, they're just done. They come out of the gates quick, but buddy, you're 15th finish. You're going to finish in 15th and that's okay. Like stop tugging on my cape type of thing. Right. And I, Mm -hmm. I, I kind of use that right there. I love these life metaphors right now, but you're hundred percent right. But I just, sorry, Ron, I just like for Dwayne, because it just seems like there's vultures always around basically. But again, Dwayne does things for the right reasons, surrounds himself with good people. And, uh, I, and I'm sure it's not, it's not easy doing what you're doing and you're second guess yourself probably every other night, wherever the case may be, but yeah, just keep plugging away, man. Keep doing good things. And yeah, I appreciate things. it. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah. And we, yeah, we talked about this a bunch, but, and I think in any business, whether it's restaurant or skill development or whatever, like, yeah, there's going to be people that are, that do pop up. And I always tell my staff and the people that work with me, just keep your head down and keep doing what we're doing. Like we're doing the right thing. We, just like you said, we're doing it for the right reasons. Just just keep doing it. Like these people are going to come and go, or if they're good, they'll stick. That's fine. And I think competition's good. When I was younger, when I first came to London, started doing this, like I was elbows up. I was going to kill every business. I was like, <laughs> wanted everyone to go bankrupt. You know what I mean? And now that I'm older and been doing it for a long time, I'm, I'm, I talk to my competitors. I, you know what I mean? It's just fine. There's a lot of kids. And if you're good and you do a good job, I respect you. And, and it makes me better because if I have a crappy product or I'm not doing a good job, then I got to pull my socks off because I'm going to end up losing business or whatever, you know? So I think, yeah, it's, it's big to just kind of you know, be confident what you got. I want to ask Ron about like, speaking of competitiveness, Ron, I, I'm kind of curious where, cause I remember I first became an athletic director. <clears throat> I'm sitting there and you basically told me sit in the back of the room. You said in a way more polite way, like basically telling me I'm uh, my house is close to the gym in that polite way. <laughs> you said like, basically sit in the back of the room, shut your mouth, raise your hand when you're told to raise your hand and just absorb what's happening. Right. So, you know, because there's a whole dynamic of, of what's happening for votes and constitution and stuff or all the athletic directors and stuff. But I was always curious when you first got into it, what was the French and English like? From what I know, it was like fire and water. Like it was not good. The relationships were not good. And I I've spoke to some people throughout the years and they kept saying like you were one of the, the pieces basically that kind of mended that French English thing and how people kind of worked a little bit together, but what did that look like at the beginning, the whole French and English thing in Sudbury? Well, for, first of all, I'll go to your first comment. I never told you to shut up and sit in the back. <laughs> what I did say <laughs> is there's a lot to learn, right? So you can't come up and, and you sit back because you had people in there with about 25, 30 years experience and they're running the meetings and they know what they're talking about and you go through the process and you did, you did it the right way. Yeah. Three, four years later, then you start taking over, right? start convening you start doing your share and now you're you're one of the top guys now right so that's how that's how it works well you get experienced people and young people coming in with energy and the system works really well with both um to your second stage um your second question uh, there was four four boards in Sudbury there's a french catholic french public English Catholic, English public. And yeah, it was kind of a war zone in those meetings. Like the French Catholic were, you know, the English people were putting us down kind of thing. And um, and we weren't necessarily doing our share because French Catholic board was basically a primary school board. They only had college for them. And uh, so they didn't have all that much 
uh, helping out with convening leagues and stuff like that. So we were kind of put down, but uh, that's okay. Like, but it got much better. We got much, much better. And then I was working with the, you know, I was president about three, four years with the United Bisson uh, from McDonald County, which is French public. And then I was convening, I was president with Denis Gauthier from LaSalle Secondary. And by then, everything was pretty smooth between all boards. And then we went down to two boards and just. Now that's, uh, that's a lot uh, of like just relationship uh, stuff, right? Like just it is. relationships over years and getting comfortable with each other and respecting right. each other, obviously, right? Yeah, I, I would share buses with Mignon Cartier and they're French Catholic and we're French, uh, we're French Catholic, they were French public and I don't care. Like yeah. he's got kids, she's taking care of her kids, I'm taking care of my kids and everybody gets along, right? It's not a, or even English school, I, I went to tournaments with English school, not as much though. Yeah. He kind of did invite us. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Well, they're big enough, right? They had, they were big enough. You got a solo well, and Lockery, all those schools, uh, they would get together and and take a bus together for track meets and all that stuff. So, I think you know, tying this back to sports a bit too, though, like that's that's something that is is a missing a little bit sometimes in sports is that is that camaraderie a little bit on not necessarily with the kids, but with the with the coaches and the and the board at the board level and stuff, and being able to work together. Because at the end of the day, who's this who's this impacting? And who's it affecting? It's affecting the kids, right? So if you've got animosity up top or you're not allowed to go to this tournament because you're this team or this language or whatever, like it's yeah. taken away from the kids' experience, right? And you got a bunch of adults bucking heads on stuff and really it's impacting the kids. And that's what I think is a shame. And we see it a lot in sports, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate. Well, jean Gilles sees it at, at his SDSSA meetings that everybody wants to take care of their kids, right? Yeah. And Dave Makla is in charge of coordinating everything. But Basically, every phys ed head wants to make a good program at their school for their kids. So get along. Everybody wants to help their kids. Yeah. Good. That's what, that's what we're there for. You know? Yeah, for sure. And JG, how do you see that relationship now? Is it pretty good at that level now? Like, is everyone? Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's very good. Um, just, everyone has their niche, right? It, it just, everyone kind of gets their niche or, you know, hockey school, basketball school, whatever the case may be. Um, and everyone's competitive, everyone's competitive and trying to get an edge some way, shape or form. But at the end of the day, really, um, yeah, I think those walls are, are, I think they're gone or if they're existing, I don't see them and everyone's in it for the right reason. At the end of the day, Ron kind of hit the nail on the head. Everyone's in there in their own pockets for the right reasons. But I think as a group itself, because as a group, you know, we hosted offsets, tons mm -hmm. of championship. You can't pull off off events like hosting an offsa if not everyone's on the same page yeah. and, and we've been able to do that because there's just Sudbury man is just like you know man you, both of you guys it's roll up your sleeves blue collared work and when you surround yourself with a bunch of people like that man and it, sky's the limit and we've pulled off a lot of great things locally because of that oh that's cool one thing too growing up even for me like i went to obviously a full french catholic uh, school elementary and then high school um but i played hockey and most of the hockey guys i played with were full English, like going to the well and lock the other schools. So there was definitely, even when I grew up that little bit of separation between French and English, right. It was and for whatever reason, it was what it was. And there's a lot of French up in, up in Northern Ontario. Right. So, but it was definitely, there was, so I had, you know, a lot of great buddies at school and I hung out with a little bit on the weekends. And then I had another group of English buddies that I hung out with at hockey and, and out on the weekends and things like that too. So there was definitely, you know, a little bit of separation. It's funny because growing up, you know, I remember we went through it at times where like, I don't want to go to French school. I, I, I don't want to do French homework, whatever that was. Now I've got kids and they're in full French school. Uh, and I think it's so important. And I'm very thankful that my parents put us in French because, you know, we had a second language. It, it helped me out when I was living in St. John and coaching in the queue. I got my French language back and was speaking French to the players. And it was, I love it. And I, I took it for granted when I was going through it. And uh, I'm really trying to like sell, not sell, but really trying to be very, positive about French around my kids. My kids love it. They've been really good. It's been great. Uh, but I really, you know, I think it's, I think it's important to just, you know, add some diversity and, you know, you meet up, you meet someone from Europe, they, they know three, five, seven languages <laughs> come from Canada. We know one, like, come on, man, at least throw a second one in there, you know? So I, I think it's important. And I think even just for opportunities later on or whatever, and just having a little bit of that diversity, I think is, uh, is huge. And I remember meeting friends through you, right? You had friends like Ralph, those guys from like yeah. Llewellyn or they're at other schools and uh, they're not bad people, right? <laughs> just because yeah. they're speaking yeah. English, they weren't bad people. You yeah. just kind of, for some reason, kind of put up those, those walls. But, but I can't even imagine like 
before, like our grandparents, great grandparents, those types of things. Basically, I just the more you hear it in mines and those types of things, the way it was. But I think Starbucks just gotten so multicultural with the mines bringing people, whatever. If you're good at your job, and I'll kind of turn that around. I want to ask you guys this, okay? Speaking of multicultural, and you're from Canada, so on and so forth. Would you? I'll use soccer as an example. Would you want that the national team coach to be a Canadian? Pick a sport. I don't care. I'm just picking soccer. Would you want him to be a Canadian and he's coaching the national team? Or would you just want the best coach in the world to coach the Canadian national team? I don't care if he was from Africa, Brazil, UK. I don't care. He's the best coach. Let's have him coach our national team. Or is it? would you need it to be a Canadian citizen? I don't, um, do you want to you want to start around or do you want me to go? Go, Dwayne. Go. Okay. I think I feel like just, you know, being proud of our country and stuff like that. I think that we, I think it'd be important to have a Canadian coach uh, coaching that team. Now, I'm going to assume that no matter what the sport is, we've got some pretty elite athletes that have played that sport that could coach it, or we have some pretty elite coaches. Not to say that that coach couldn't get some consultation from another country or another coach or something like that. But I think, I think it would be important to have a Canadian or, you know, a U.S. coach in the U.S. team for us in Canada. I think it would be important to have a, a Canadian coach coach in that sport for sure. That'd be my, uh, that'd be my take on it. What do you think, Ron? Well, I don't know if I'll talk about a sport you guys don't know much of probably curling. If you look at all the other countries, they're all taking Canadians as national coaches. Really? Okay. Yeah. Because, because our Canadian curlers are, are quite knowledgeable, right? So developing countries in curling are the Chinese, the Swedes even, are taking our top Canadians and getting them to coach. So that's different opinion, right? Yeah, uh, sure. You look at our, our Toronto Raptors have an American, right? Yeah. And Nick Nurse, so. Yeah. I think I in post sports, yeah, I think in post sports, it's, I, I think with the for me anyway, I'm just thinking about like the pride of Canada or being, you know, proudful as, as a Canadian. But you're right, Ron. Even we have a goalie here that's uh, in London. He's he's you know probably early 30s, really good player. Like up and down the NHL a little bit. Went over to the KHL over in Europe. Played there for years. Well, he ended up going to Korea, and the reason he went to Korea is because they were going to get him his passport and play on the Olympic team. And he plays on the Korean Olympic team. And he ended up like he played Canada a couple like what I think was last Olympics. And he's getting ready to go back over there to go back to camp for their for their Olympic team. So he's a clear cut Canadian, but he's you know their number one goalie in Korea type thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's so you know what I mean. You're gonna have that kind of bouncing around a little bit, obviously, but um, yeah, that's that's but for Jean Gilles' sake. I'd say if we have a Canadian and all things equal, take the Canadian, right? Yeah, for sure. What do you think, JG? I don't know, man. I just I don't, I didn't really have an have an opinion, some, but I like the fact, kind of like what you're saying too, where bring somebody else in, like have your person wherever it is, but like network. But I think that's what all the, the top coaches, I think that's their thing, right? Is like they would network. They would pull from any resources they could because that's what's going to make them the best. Hence probably why curling, like, hey, if we want to be the best, we got to pull in the best to be that, right? I'm assuming that's what it is. So I don't know if there's any borders to it. But like when I look at Toronto Blue Jays, in my opinion, like if there's any good Canadians, you need to have them on your team. You just, if I'm the Toronto Blue Jays, yes. I need to have a Canadian on my team. Yes. Is a different story. We can, you know, yeah. there's tons of Canadians for that, for that sake, but you need to have that, that content. And the reason I think, for example, the Blue Jays, like if you want to grow a sport, you want to grow a culture, you want to grow a country, like you got to show other kids in the country, Hey man, he's one of yours. Yeah. He made it. You can make it. That That's the way I look at it for that part. Anyway. I like that. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's, super important man having those role models even basketball like you know the raptors win they you know win the championship yeah. and you know that that's huge for the basketball like for young kids playing basketball seeing that run we're the you know we the north like it's it's awesome man and you know guarantee that basketball has picked up a little bit of a t you know went up some ticks and just popularity and more kids playing it and i think it's i think it's huge man it's yeah super super important to have that that canadian representation for sure Boys, listen, man, I love, love doing this. I'm going to leave with it, with one more question, GG. If you have any more questions, fire away. But I'm going to ask uh, Ron because obviously, Ron, you've um, you've got three, you know, like JG said, three beautiful kids, and you've gone through the the mixer. And and if we look at like a, a team or a I, I use that for what's that? I didn't say anything. Oh, okay, sorry, maybe JG did. Um, but I think, uh, but yeah. So like, any advice for JG and I? Because we're kind of in the rookie stages right now. We got young kids right now. We're kind of in the rookie stages. But any advice for us as far as just like, kind of getting through, 
because I've got I've got a nine year old and seven year old, and I'm not sure how to get them to 19, 20. So, do you have any 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 ideas for me in those in those gap years? Um, yeah, be there for them. Yeah, they're going to be playing sports. Be at the games. Coach them if you need to, but if you're coaching them, make sure there's not any there's no favoritism in there kind of thing. I've coached all my kids, and except Marty didn't want to get coached for it, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> um, like I said a while ago, you want your kids to be independent. So encourage independence so they can get on their own, you know, like take care of their own things. Um, yeah, no, I think that's huge. It's funny. I was talking to my, uh, my young guy and I said to him, I was like, uh, when dad's on the ice with your coach and you, like, do you, do you feel like one of the boys or do you feel like, like my son, you know, like I'm your dad. And uh, he's like, no, I feel like, I feel like one of the boys, I feel like you're like, you're just the coach. And I'm like, perfect. Right. So having those kind of conversations, I right. think it's huge. I'm sure you've had those and Marty didn't want you to coach. Okay. I'm not going to coach, but okay. having those kind of conversations, I think is, is huge. Right. Just to have that, that relationship, number one with your kids, but making sure that they're cool with the decisions sometimes that we make as adults too. Yeah. You're not dad, you're coach. Yeah. But I, I just think I don't regret anything in my career, but I, I coached an awful lot, so I wasn't with my kids all, you know, unless yeah. I was coaching them. Uh, I, I, that's why I'm spending a lot of time with grandkids now, because I didn't spend that much time with my kids. I spent my time, with, you know, yeah. other people's kids, but I don't regret it. Like, it was a great experience. Yeah. But, yeah, give your kids time. And, and try to pick up if you see big changes, like, if all of a sudden they sh they should be motivated, right? If they're not motivated, all of a sudden they lose all their motivation. Something's making them on, you know, unhappy kind of thing. So, yeah, keep an eye on on behaviors kind of thing. But if you're with there with the kids all the time, then no need, right? I think that's that's huge, man. Especially during this you know during this time that we're going through, obviously. But being aware of your kids, like tendencies and attitude and things like that. Cause you're right. It's, it could be little changes, but, and I think asking questions, right. And I know right. it's kind of, you know, sometimes that's annoying. Dad's bugging me. Mom's bugging me. She always asks me, but eventually I think kids will talk to you and, and they'll tell you. And, um, cause you're, yeah, you gotta be aware of that. JG, I was just talking about like how to get my kids from like seven and nine years old to like 1920 and just <laughs> like, how do you bridge that gap? Right. Um, but yeah, I think it's huge. And JG, you, you're, you coach your boys a little bit, right? With that, with, you know, the, with uh, baseball and stuff like that. How do you, how do you approach that as far as kind of separating dad to coach and things like that? Struggling, struggling. <laughs> I'm struggling. Like, honestly, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I talked to my wife not long ago about that. I was like, I feel bad for one of my kids that, that I coach just for the fact, I think I'm more coach than I am dad. Um, I don't know if he ever sees me as a dad, to be honest with you, because it seems like it's always on. Uh, so I have to figure out a way how to be able to, turn the switch off basically and just listen maybe, or just, I, I'm still struggling with that. To be honest with you, I don't, I, I, I can't get up in a pedestal here and tell you how to do it. Cause I, I'm trying to figure it out myself right now. Um, but I, I'm aware of it, I guess. That's the first step, I guess, in this rehab, I guess is going, uh, but, but like to, to emphasis back that Ron was saying is just being there basically. Right. So I got, you know, one's right into acting and parkour and stuff and the other one's into, baseball and volleyball and basketball and stuff like that. So it's just one, one direction. I'm like, I, I can help guide this one. Cause I'm familiar with this, this one. I'm not example for the acting. So now I'm like trying to tap into any resource or read anything or talk to anybody in the industry or where the case may be. Um, and just, Hey man, how can you help me out? Or how can you help my kid? And, um, and, and that regard basically, but it's uh, I don't know, man, ask me maybe in another 10 years, basically. And hopefully they're just good people. And yeah. then, We'll know, but my wife dominates more of that part, so they'll be all right. They'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, perfect. You got a good partner there. Well, <laughs> the only other thing I could say, I guess, is not to be a helicopter parent. If you if a kid gets in trouble with with a teacher, let him try to get out of it by himself. You know, if a kid gets in trouble, he's got problems with a coach. Let him try to deal it. You know, don't deal with all their problems. You know, we we'll talk to coaches and stuff. Like they can do it. It's funny you say that. The, uh, my kid had a basketball coach two years, a really, really good basketball coach. So he plays jam one year, trials out the next year, doesn't make the team, gets cut. Um, there's no right or wrong way to make cuts. Anyways, the no. cuts are made. 
doesn't make the team. This is two years ago, maybe three now. I still talk to the coach to this day because I loved his philosophy. I love the way he did things, how he organized his practices. He was in it for the right reasons, so on and so forth. And maybe the best thing to ever happen, basically. But let my kid deal with it at the time. It wasn't like, hey, how come my kid didn't make the team? Billy made the team. Or how come your kid, my kid's better than your kid? That's not how it works, man. No. So um, you just, and, and it's not easy. I get what Ron's saying. That's not easy. Uh, it's probably a hard thing to do at some point. But like you said, I heard there's two ways to raise your kids. You raise them to take care of you or you raise them to take care of themselves. And I'm making an assumption here. They're trying to raise our kids to take care of themselves. Yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, I'd love my kids to make enough money that they can take care of me when I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of, uh, they're kind of my retirement plan right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I think it's huge. This episode is going to be in your will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. Um, I think one other thing too on that though is like what you said, Ron, I think is massive. Like just teaching your kids how to speak to authorities or adults. Cause it's, it's, it is intimidating. Like, you know, even I remember when I was going through it, I wish I was better at communicating with my coaches. I was always like a little bit, not intimidated. I just respected them. And I, wouldn't probably ask the right questions. And I played with other guys and girls that were just like, no problem talking to the coach, asking them stuff. And I just, I was always just, you know, I didn't do enough of that. And I'm really trying to preach that to my kids. You know, they want something from their coach or my little guy wanted to go on the ice and help out with the younger kids at one point last year. And I was like, okay, well go ask, go ask the lead. Like go ask Kim, like she's in charge and go ask her if you're allowed to do it. He's like, I'm not going to ask him. Like, well, if you want to go ask her. <laughs> So I went with him, yeah. but he did all the talking and asked, and she said, yeah, no problem. So thank you. And so uh, like just putting them in those situations that are a bit uncomfortable, right. obviously, but then hopefully, hopefully it sinks in and they're able to, you know, exactly. You said, be independent, you know, do their thing yeah. and, and, you know, be confident in that stuff, which is huge. It's um, like, like you said, the communication is the huge piece. And it's just like, you know, when they're trying to talk to their coach and they're picking their shirts or their, their arms are crossed, like it's, it's all that nonverbal, basically like, Hey man, he's a human being or she's a human being take a deep breath. Like it's that whole, cause it's going to be a job because we're going to work more than we're going to play sports. Right. So it's like job interview, all those other things that they, they become more important, I guess, at the end of the day, but that's, that's for him, for your kid to be able to go do that and you guide him in that direction, that would be valuable forever. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And that, uh, going back on the coaching, coaching our own kids and Ron, you got a ton of experience in this, but I'm going through right now, kind of the process of like my, my young guy's getting into like more competitive. Now he's out of like kind of the IP and development. Now he's getting into like, you know, maybe travel hockey or whatever. So I talked about it a little bit, but I think it's really important to like, so am I going to coach him or not? I, I don't know yet, but um, it's having that conversation with him too, like with my son and saying, Hey, are you cool if I coach? Like, are you, and then I, and then I think revisiting it throughout the year, because I'm sure I'm going to be hard on him in certain situations. You know, I know I'm probably not going to favor him. So he's probably going to get the short end of the stick or he won't be on in the last minute of the game. Cause I don't want to, you know, he's my kid. Um, so I think those are things that I want to have those conversations with him. Like for instance, he came, he came like came to our hockey school that we run in the summer and before the week starts, I'm like, dude, like you're not going to get a prize this week for like camp. <laughs> it's like, why not? You know, he's like seven or eight years old at the time. Like, cause you're my son. And I run this thing and you're not going to get it. So just like, get your head wrapped around this. Yeah, yeah. You're not coming home with a hat or a shirt from this camp, you know? And he was good. Like he was great. You know, some days he'd be like, Oh, like I worked really hard today. I'm like, dude, you work hard for you not to get a shirt or a hat, you know? And, and, but it's those conversations and having that communication with them that and managing expectations a little bit too, you know? I think Did you at least get a McDonald's or something after, like an ice cream or a Gatorade <laughs> after at least instead of a hat? Not a chance, <laughs> but ice cubes, ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> From the holiday in, because you didn't want to buy a bag. You're so cheap. <laughs> I also think that after the game, the game is over. Then you become a parent again, right? You've yeah. got to leave that coaching oh. in the gym or on the ice. Game, game's funny. over. Not, I'm not going to nag you all the way home in the car. You know, that's game. Why not? Practice over, game's over. How do you do that? <laughs> that is hard. It's really hard. That is hard. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at my... At my house, all the girls were playing basketball. So we talked basketball, but we didn't talk about results or games kind of thing. We just yeah. shoot the shit about basketball, but yeah. not the games. I we like didn't that. rehash the games. Okay, so let me ask you this, Ron. Like, let's say you're coaching a game, good game, competitive, maybe, you know, you know, when one of your daughters is playing and they're not playing well, they're out of it, they're just not having a good game, turn the ball over, all that kind of stuff, like, I, I know for me, like the competitive side of me and I bite my tongue. I really do. I try not to have these conversations with my kids at all, but I'm like hot. Cause I know he's better. I know she's better than what she showed. So how like when you got in the car after the game, like, like was there a party that just wanted to like 
talk to her about how bad she was that game or <laughs> always just like like were you pretty good at just being able to park it and let it go okay i, I hope she doesn't see this but oh yeah i'm sending that <laughs> for sure <laughs> no i was uh one thing that they all gave and is 100 percent effort all the time yeah. so there's never a time i can't say that there was never a time where they didn't try right well then there's yeah. nothing to criticize yeah your shot is off or whatever but you gave you know you gave 100 percent out there you're dying all the time so what else is there to ask you know so you put the emphasis on the effort, not the result. Always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. You're, you're going to be the hardest working team out there. Even with Jean Gilles teams and, and your team, like we weren't the best team, but we didn't get out work too often. Yeah, too often. for sure. No, definitely. I think, yeah, I think that is, that is huge. Like those, those post game conversations for parents, even if you're not coaching just in the car or in the walk home or whatever, it's really hard to bite your tongue. It really is. But just maybe repositioning your questions a little bit, right? Instead of, you know, like, like you said, man, you couldn't hit the net today. Like what's going on, right? And I, one thing I started doing, and JJ, I think you and I talked about this, is just asking them questions about what they thought of the game. You know, like who do you think was good? Like who do you think played good? And, you know, how, what, what do you think of the game? And how, how do you think you played? And I always try to compliment, to your point, Ron, like that was a great back check. You know, in soccer, man, you did a really good job hunting the ball today. You, you was really good. You know, yeah, you might have scored a goal, and that's great. And then sometimes they'll say, "Yeah, but I scored." I'm like, "Yeah, totally, it was great." But you made a really good pass on the other player, or whatever. And kind of those, the, I want them to really value the, the game, like the parts of the game that don't show up on the highlights or the score sheet, or you know what I mean, the 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 game. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that I've tried to do anyway. And I'm not perfect mm-hmm. at it by any means. Like there's times where. And then my wife just hears it, right? If she's beside me in a game and I'm watching it, I'm like, oh my God, like she could have had that. Why is she not running her? What's going on? You know? And, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's part of the, part of the whole process. Dwayne, I, I want to switch gears for a sec. Okay. Cause I was just about to talk about an athlete. I'm actually going to talk about the athlete. Then I want to get Ron's perspective because I know he lived this and I hope to God, I don't have to live it, but life happens is losing an athlete. Hmm. How, actually, I'll just leave it at that. How did you deal with that? Oh boy. I didn't want to relive that one. Um, my, well, he wasn't, he wasn't a player. He was my statistician because as a young person, he'd had heart surgery and he wasn't allowed to strenuous work. So he followed my team for about three years and he'd give me all the stats and everything else. And, and uh, I got that one call one night that he passed away on the tennis court with one of my players. So that was really tough. Took me a long time to deal with that. Oh yeah, terrible. How old was he, Ron? He was in grade twelve. Jeez. He died in two thousand. Wow. Yeah, that's that's terrible. How how was the uh, how how did the team take it and stuff like that? Must have been so hard on the players. Well, the whole process was hard, right? Because they were the pallbearers. We were the guarding it you know like yeah. made with their uniforms on and everything else and i was the one that his mother asked me to to do the do the, the finishing words at the funeral oh boy yeah so, yeah i'll be tough now. that was a really hard part yeah definitely cried for about three days there trying to get that speech done but then again when you're doing that speech at the end you can't be crying you've got to be positive and everything else but that was Probably the hardest thing I've ever done. No doubt, man. Especially at that age. That's, uh, yeah, that's that's a tough one. And that's what I was thinking about doing for you and I. Like, I've been, and I, I think the word's fortunate enough to not have to to go through that because I think, like Ron, you put so much into the kids and the time and so on and so forth. You're like, holy smokes. And there, and now when I was getting to that point, basically, because we have a kid on our team, he had cancer before I had him. He had brain cancer. He battled it. He's back. I've had him for a couple of years on my team. And I've had conversations with kid just loves life, but his parents and like, you know, how he played, they don't even care. Right. They're just at the point, like there's bigger things in life. And, but it took that to happen in life. And I'm just worried for me personally, sometimes like, I don't want shit like that to happen for me to start realizing, like change the subject in the vehicle, man. Cause this is not the end of the world. Right. There's way crazier things than this. Mm-hmm. I just hope it doesn't take something like that to happen to kind of flip the switch basically. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, partly too, though, Jay, it's the, it's the voice in your head, man, telling you to shut your yap, you know? And at the end of the day, honestly, like I do, I'm like, what are you doing, man? Shut up. Like, 
And I think sometimes too, I got to remember like my kid's nine. Man, at nine years old, I didn't even have skates on yet. You know what I mean? (laughs) He's already better than I was, you know, at 12 and he's eight, right? So like if he's outside shooting pucks, like I never go tell him what to do. I'm just, if you ask me, I'll go out and pass pucks with him. I'll go play with him a bit, but I'm not like, Hey, when you do this, do this. Like if I'll say, Hey, do you want some help with that? And he'll be like, no. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but I really try not to, yeah, I really try not to coach him too much, you know, on, on a daily, right. I just let him do his thing, be a kid. He just wants a bigger rink. He just wants a bigger <laughs> rink. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, it, de- it depends who, how your kid is too. Like there's two uh, kinds of kids. Some can really, see their talent okay i've got lots of talent or i don't have much talent some other kids are totally blind like they have no idea they think they're really good and they're not yeah you know and those are the ones that are hard to to deal with right they don't see the picture they don't yeah oh for sure and i think you know jg i'm sure and ron you've dealt with this for years i'm sure but also they get a bit of an inflated self of themselves because of their surroundings because grandma's telling them how good they are, mom or dad are, and you know, oh, you're a, you're a point guard, you're a scorer, you're this, and they, so they think that and they believe it instead of being really honest with your kids and saying, you know what I mean, and not to say you got to tell your kid, hey, you're a third liner, buddy, like you're never going to be a scorer, like you know, <laughs> give, hope, give them hope, but you know, being realistic with it, right? And I think I think that's you, just managing their expectations a little bit, not inflating them too much. Well, you want to reinforce their strength. If if he's a digger, then just push that item, right? Be the first one in the corner. Try to try to be the first one in the corner. That kind of stuff. Yeah. So you're still reinforcing positively, but you're not saying, "Oh, you got to score two goals here." Like you know. Yeah. Totally. Oh, that's great. For that's sure. easy to get result oriented, I guess. Right? Score a goal and give you ten bucks like that. That's 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 got to be out the window, man. Well, and I don't know. You're like Jay, but like I'm. You know, I love my kids, and they make me proud. All, you know, every day. And when they're playing and they're doing well, like you want them to, you know, you want them to succeed. Every, every parent does, you know what I mean? So that makes it hard too when they don't play well, or they, you know, they mean they caught, they, they fumble a ball, they, they caught, you know, they cough up a puck or whatever like that. So it's hard. It's, it's an emotional roller coaster. This parenting thing's a joke. Like, I don't know why nobody told me about this before I had kids. It's a joke. The thing is, and I've had these conversations with parents, like the parents have to realize their kids are not a reflection of them. If that makes any sense, like they are, don't get me wrong, but they're not like your kid coughs up the puck or strikes out or whatever the case may be. Doesn't mean you suck as a parent and everyone's looking at you like, Hey, you should have did a better job with your kid. He wouldn't have coughed it up, but that's how we take it as parents. We take that so personal that they're a reflection of us. And, and, and I think that's the part, man, we got to cut that umbilical cord. He or she or themselves, we are ourselves. And that is what it is. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think that's the process. Oh, it's a great point, man. Very, very well said. Well, boys, listen, man, I took up a lot of your time today and I really do appreciate it. It's a beautiful, for a nice sunny week we've had. We've got a nice day today as well. So uh, I really appreciate you guys jumping on, man. This was uh, awesome. And Ron, thank you for your time. It was really uh thank great you, to catch man. up and get some good advice. I'll be watching this episode about 17, 18 times. So I, can absorb <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank my neck for setting it up, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, oh, I good. did already. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, boys. That was great, man. JG, thanks again, buddy. It's always good to, to chat with you and your yeah, 100%. Hair. Thanks for having us. Thanks for doing thanks. it. Thanks, Dwayne. We'll see you, Jean Gilles. Awesome. Thanks, right. Dwayne. Um, yeah. To kind of raise that bar. Uh, that extra gear, the first three steps, huge strides in the performance. That I might not be the player I am today. 